So should we get started? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a project called Auto FDO. Uh, my name is De Hao Chen, and I'm working with David Lee in the Google uh, compiler team. So in this talk, I will first uh, uh, briefly talk about what we have done in this project in the past few years. And then I will walk you through some more details about how other FDO works in GCC. And, uh, and finally, we will introduce uh, what, we'll, what we plan to do in the near future about this project. So what is auto FDO? So before we go into the details, let's first look at uh, how traditional instrumentation-based FDO works. So it's basically a three-step process. First, you need to instrument, by, uh, instru uh, instrument the source code to produce the instrumented binary. And then you run the instrumented binary to produce, uh, to, to produce a profile. And then you rebuild the source code with the profile to generate the optimized binary. So the problem for this approach is that the instrumented binary is usually very slow. So when we, uh, in, in our experiments, we, it's very usual to see more than 10x slowdowns in uh, parallel applications. So to solve this problem, we propose to use, uh, to skip the instrumentation step, but just use the sampling-based approach to profile on an optimized binary. And then uh, we use a sampling-based profile to uh, feedback to the compiler and uh, use auto, uh, auto FDO options to build an optimized binary. So uh, the benefit of this approach is that the profiling is, is very lightweight. It's usually less than 1% of the overhead, which is negligible. So this make it, makes it possible to, uh, to collect the profiles directly from the production systems. And it, it's even possible that we can uh, we can profile on some user devices like the phone or the tablets. So now a little bit history of this project. So the initial idea of this project uh, of the using the sampling based approach to drive the drive FDO uh, was uh, was like six years ago. So at the beginning we implemented this uh, in Open64 compiler, and in 2008 we ported it uh, to GCC. And later, we add the value profiling and the LiPo support. Uh, so in the in initial sampling-based FDO implementation, uh, unlike the instrumentation-based approach, we use a source location to represent the profile. And because the profile was uh, collected on an optimized binary, so we need to be very careful when we annotate the profile. We, we use a two-phase annotation to handle the, in the inline functions, which is very complicated. And, and when we build the weighted control flow graph, we use a minimum cost flow algorithm to make sure the flow is consistent. So, uh, so this MCF algorithm is very expensive and very, very complicated and difficult to debug. So back in 2010, we have this implementation ready in GCC, and we, uh, we actually got very good speed ups on spec benchmarks. But no one is willing to tune it further for Google internal applications because it's simply too complicated. So back in the middle of 2011, we decided to redesign this to make, uh, make this as simple as possible. And we renamed this as Auto FDO because we want to make this truly automatic, which means that we want to have uh, little, uh, as, as little uh, uh, human interventions in the profile collection and the pr uh, profile use steps. So we started with a cost grain implementation, which turned out to be uh, not very effective. And then in 2012, we changed the direction to focus on the fine grain profile. And in, uh, earlier this year, we also had the value profiling and the LiPo support. And the uh, implementation now, uh, is ready now in 4.7 and 4.8, but they are, they are both, uh, both in Google branches. OK, now let's uh, look some more details into how AutoFDO works. First, let's look at the profile representation. 
So there are three types of profiles that AutoFDU use. One, the first one is the source profile, which is basically a map for inline stack to runtime information. So what is inline stack? So inline stack is a stack of uh, data structures that can represent the source information. So for each, uh, for each instructions in the, in the optimized binary, it can be mapped to an inline stack. So uh, the, the, the inline stack can have multiple levels. So the first level can be mapped to any arbitra arbitrary source location, but the other, other levels will all be mapped to an inlined, co uh, inlined call site. And the bottom level of the inline stack actually tells where, where this instruction is coming from. So uh, we, we store the profile as a map from the inline stack as the key. And the key was grouped by the function name of the bottom level. And the value of the, prof, uh, of the map is the runtime information, which, which, uh, which includes the execution count and the number of instructions that's mapped to the, instruction, uh, to the, to the inline stack. And also, if we find, uh, uh, it, it, it can also contain the value profile, such as the indirect call targets and the how many times each target was invoked. <coughs> uh, now, let's take a look at an example. So in the program on the left-hand side, we have two functions, foo and bar. And uh, in the line number 12 of function bar, we see there's a function call, in, a function call to, to foo. So we assume that in the profile binary, which is optimized, the, uh, the, the call site in line 12 was, was in lines. So if we run this program and collect the profile, we may get a, 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 pro a source profile look like in the right-hand side. So we see in the function foo, because there's no call site, so every, source locate, uh, every inline stack is just one level. But in function bar, because the line 12 was in line, so everything in line from, uh, from this call site will have two levels of in line stack. Like the third line, it's basically from function foo, the uh, line uh, number two from function foo, but it's in line from the line number 12 in function bar. And it's mapped to an execution count of 1200. So this is how the source profile looks like. So the source profile is the major profile that's that's the most useful thing in the auto FDO profile. Uh, the second profile auto FDO use is a histogram profile, which basically tells how many instructions will execute uh, consumes how many how many percentage of the total cycles total total samples. So this this profile was used to to evaluate the hotness of an instruction or, or a basic block or function, and it, it's also used to to get the size of a working set, which is used to check if we want to enable aggressive optimization such a, uh, th that could lead to extensive, intensive code bloat like loop and rolling. Uh, the third, uh, third part of the profile is called module profile. This is used for LiPo uh, uh, to, to do the mod module grouping decisions. Because LiPo is not yet in chunk, so I'm not gonna go too much detail into this. Okay, then how do we generate this profile? So the profile was generated in two steps. The first step, uh, we, will, we will use, uh, it's, to it's to collect the raw profile, which uh, includes two pieces of information that would be useful. One is how many times each instruction is executed. Uh, the other in information is how many times each indirect call target is executed. So to get this information, we use Linux perf to sample the last branch record, or LBR, and the, this will produce us a perf.data file. So, so the way how this works is that uh, the, the operating system will peri uh, periodically uh, interrupt, and the, in the interrupt handler, it will record the last 16 entries of the t uh, taken branches into a buffer. And when the profile finishes, a uh, profile ter terminates, it will record this buffer back to a perf.data file. So this can give us the profiles we want. And, and the recording was done by hardware, so it's very fast. But the problem is it's only supported by Intel architecture. And we only need, uh, and, and we actually need this because 
we have experimented many different type of profiling mechanisms, but this is the only one so far that can give us accurate binary level profile. And the, 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 well, we need the binary level profile to be very accurate, otherwise the performance of other FDO will not, that be, uh, will not be good. Okay, after we get the raw profiles, the next step is to generate a profile that can be actually used inside GCC. So we have a tool to do this, which takes uh, two type of data as inputs. The first data is the profitable data file that generated in the previous step. Uh, the second input is an unstripped binary. So we need an unstripped binary because we need a debug info, which is used to get the inline, inline stack that's used to represent the profile. But we can always like strip the profile, uh, no, strip the binary and put that to run in the production and cut the profile. But when we get the profile back, we keep the unstrip, unstrip the binary somewhere so that the tool can have access to it. So the tool, so the tool itself is now used internally in Google, and we are trying to open source this tool. And there are two pieces of dependencies here. So one is we need to have uh, have something to pass the debug information. So right now we use a Google internal implementation of a just to line library, which is very fast, but it only supports the x86 or, or and the Linux, I guess. And and the other part of a, a component that we depend on, depend on is uh, the profitable data parser. Right now we use a, a parser called Creeper, which is part of the, which is also open sourced and it's part of the Chrome OS. So the tool itself is optimized to be uh, as fast as possible. So so normally for very large binary and for large very large profile, it only takes like 15 to 30 seconds to to produce a profile that can be used by GCC. Okay, now we generate the profile. Uh, we, we need to tell GCC how to use this profile. So the first step in GCC is that before, uh, after it reads in the profile, it will generate a temporary in internal representation called contact sum summary map. So, so a contact summary map is basically a map for an inlined call site uh, to a total sample count for all instructions in the inlined callee. And the uh, inline call site is, is also represented by an inline stack, except that the top level is also, should also be an inline in, in, in uh, call, call site. So, so let's take a, a look at an example here. So in the profile listed in the left hand side, we see uh, there are like seven, or eight, seven entries. So for the first two entries, they share the same uh, inline call site at uh, line number 20, to, it's a call to function foo. So we will add an entry in the contact sum summary map with the sum of these two entries in the profile. And we do the same thing for the call site at line 22, which is call to function parts. And, and then we look, look at the profile and find that there are five of entries that share the same call site of in function man at line number 10, and the call site is called to function bar. So we will also add this entry with all the sum of these entry, uh, uh, entries in the profile. And finally, we add another entry for the call site at line number, number 15. So, so then we, we get the contact summary map, which has four entries. Okay, after we get the contact summary map, we will use this to guide the early inline decisions. So the intuition here is that we want to make sure that for each, uh, if, if a call site was inlined in a profiled binary, we want to make, uh, and in the profile, we find that the call site is hot, then we want to make sure that this call site is also inlined after the early inline decisions. So the, the reason we want to do that is that we want to make sure that uh, the hot pass patterns after the early inline should exactly match the hot pa pass pattern in the, in, in the uh, profiled binary. So this would make the next step, the profile annotation, very easy. So the way we do the early inline is, is uh, like iterative, uh, iterative uh, inline decision making. 
So for each for each function, we will traverse all its core sites, and for each core site, we will find the inline stack in the contact summary map, and we will check if the count in the contact summary map is uh, is larger than the threshold, which means it's hot. Then we will inline this uh, core site, even though it could lead to code uh, code growth in the early inline phase. And then we will add the colleagues call sites to the caller so that in the next iteration we will have more work to do. So it's iter iterative and basically make this inline decision a top top down decision, a uh, top down inline decision. But let, let's t just take a look at the, the following example. So in the left hand side we have a contact summary map. And when we look at the function bar, we find there are two call sites there in the contact summary map, but none of them are hot. So none of them will be in line. The threshold is 50. And then we look at the function man. And at this time, there's only two cosines in function man. And both of the cosines are above the threshold. So we will inline this, bo both of these cosines. And when we inline in function bar, we will add the bus, uh, uh, bus cosines into the working list. So in the next iteration, we'll look at the added, newly added call sites and find that the first one is hot and we will inline the first one. But the second one, we will just keep it not inlined. So after the early inline phase, there, there will be two... There, yeah. Any question? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you know, what happens uh, when the O2 inlining decisions was not transitive. Mm -hmm. Why do you have the, for example, the Trump 3D benchmark? Mm -hmm. And you have the flatten attribute, which flattens the large function. Mm -hmm. And then the functions, you know, which are used in this large functions, are used in some of the core functions too. So with this system, you will get all the inlining happening open up, and you will get also what grows in the core section this time. But only for hot functions, hot uh, core sets. Yeah, but you know, you have you have this hot function which has a huge a huge whole stack inlined into it. And you have some function here, mm -hmm. uh, which is also used in some calls like a car called area. So in your system, uh, it will become hot, and mm -hmm. you will get inline everything into it, and then even in the call area, it will be huge, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understand, but uh, but in the later IPA inline phase, yeah. if we inline most of the hot call sites in the IPA inline phase, the the inline call site will be much less than before. So, so the code size, we, we measure the code size growth is actually less than the, the, with the IPA in line. So, so just to sort of recap, mm -hmm. so you were focusing on the call sites as opposed to the, to the things that are being called. So for example, yeah. the thing that's being called, mm -hmm. um, let's say foo, mm -hmm. um, it will only be in line where it's hot. Mm -hmm. It'll stay out of line mm -hmm. otherwise, right? Uh, so, so if a, if a inline, uh, if a function is inlined in the profiled binary and it's hot, then we will we will inline that. But once you decided to inline it, is it inlined everywhere that it's going to be called, or is it only inlined at the places you decided are hot? Just the place we decided is hot. Yeah. So it's very context sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, but, okay, we can yeah we, we can talk that offline. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so this, uh, after the early inline, well, as, as I talked before, so the, the reason that we design early inline like this is that we want to make sure the, the hot pass structure is, will match the profiled binary. So the profile annotation will become very simple. So we just do a one pass, one, f a one phase annotation, unlike the sample FDO implementation we do two phase and and in this pass it's just uh, uh, for each basic block we will traverse all its statements and uh, use the inline stack to find the execution count and use the execution count to get the basic block count and after that we will use a, heurist, a heuristic based iterative algorithm to propagate on the control flow graph to estimate the edge count and and also if we find uh, there, there's value profile information in the inline stack, we will also uh, annotate this in the, in, in the statement and uh, do the value profiling transformations. 
So after everything is annotated on the control flow graph, then the rest of things becomes very simple. So we just reuse everything FDO use. So, but, but there are still some special tunings needed. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the traditional instrumentation-based profile checks if the entry basic block of a function is zero. If it's zero, it, it considers this function never executed. But this may not be true in sample-based FDO because it's a statistical-based approach. So even the, the entry block has no sample count, its body could still be very hard. So we, have, we, we need to f be very careful when checking the entry basic block count. And there, there are s several tunings about this. And after the tuning, so uh, we compare the performance of our FDO with the traditional instrumentation-based FDO for some Google internal benchmarks. So we see that performance is very close for m most of the benchmarks. And the average performance difference is like within 10%. This, I mean, the speed up itself is 10% different. Uh, OK, so in previous slides, I, uh, I, I talk about what have we done. So next, in the next few slides, I will briefly talk, what, talk, talk about what we plan to do next. But before, uh, before we talk, talk about that, let's first recall how the traditional instrumentation works. So it's basically instrument the binary and the run a load test and the collect the profile and the use the profile to optimize, to build an optimized binary and deploy that optimized binary to the production. So, so far, how auto FDO helps is that it replaced the instrumentation based binary with the O2 binary. So this can make the load test ma much faster, but still, we cannot deploy the, uh, an O2 binary to the production. This is because, as we see in the experiments, uh, for, for many applications, the O2 binary is, is still like 10 to 40% slower than the other FDO optimized bin binary. So what we hope to happen at the end of the day is that we want to deploy an other FDO optimized binary in production and profile on the production and get the profile back and store it in the source repository. And next time we release this same binary, we will get the profile back and use that old profile to optimize for the new source. So this makes it possible that we only need to build it, every, every time we do a release, we only need to build it once instead of build it twice and run the load test. But this is a very challenging, ta challenging task. There are uh, two major challenges here. So one is that we are actually using the, the old source, source uh, old profile to optimize for a new source, which may, which should have some source changes. And if you, but, but the problem is that if you want to want to benefit from the, the convenience of just compile it once, probably you need to live with this. And we have some experiments to compare how the speed up looks like when we use old profiles to, to optimize for the uh, changed binary. We can see that in some applications which are relatively stable, so the code changes is less likely to affect the hot pass of the function. So even when we use like profiles of six months old, it still can get the same speed up as using the, using the exact match profile. But for some benchmarks that's evolving very fast, we, we see as the time goes by, as the staleness of the profile increases, the performance will decrease. But in, even in the worst case, when we use a six months pro old profile, we still get something like half of the speed up comparing with using the, the exact match profile. Yeah. Um, how do you get a speed up when as the profile get, gets staler, and so the red line. Is a stale profile better than a fresh profile? Well, I think it's like within noise range. Ah. It's like less than 1% difference. Okay. Yeah. No, that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. How do you deal, uh, deal with uh, changes in the file? Uh -huh. so for instance, if you insert one line at the beginning of the file, uh -huh. do you have all the all the lines 
one-off? Yeah, we have some. Or, or you look at the source repository uh -huh. from, from the day you got the... So we actually try to make it as simple as possible. So instead of use the absolute line number, we use offset. So if we insert one line at the middle of another function, this will at least not affect the functions so it's outside. Start of the function definition process. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we can actually do final gram, like start of a, like a loop or something. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so the the takeaway is that. If, if, if the profile is not that old, it's like one week or one month old, probably we, it could still be use, useful to optimize for a changed source. The other challenge we have is that, remember that when we, when we, if we set up the pipeline I described before, we're actually not profiling on an O2 binary. Instead, we're profiling on an auto, uh, auto FDO optimized binary. So, we do some experiments to simulate simulate this iterative auto FDO uh, optimization and find some, see some very interesting graph. So uh, every other every other iterations we will see some performance decrease or increase. So it's uh, it's in the range of about one percent to four percent performance difference, but definitely out of the range of the noise. So why is that? So the problem is that when we cut uh, the auto FDO profile is highly dependent on the debugging for in the in the profile the binary, and some uh, FDO based optimizations can change can actually change the debugging for. So for example, if we have a uh, if in the O2 binary we have a uh, we have an indirect call, and in the profile we find this indirect call is very hot, and we probably will propose uh, in, in a when we build with auto FDO, we probably will promote that indirect call to a direct call, or even inline this in, in, uh, inline this direct call. So in the next iteration, when we profile, we will see no indirect call anymore. So, so uh, in that profile, if we use to build an auto FDO optimized binary, then this call site will not uh, this this indirect call will not be promoted. But next time, it will will again be promoted. So we see this like zigzag curve. The same, uh, we also observe the same uh, similar uh, optimizations for loop and rolling. And the, the solution, a possible solution to this problem is that we can encode part of the compiler optimizations to, to the, uh, in, the, in, in the debugging form. So the profile generation tool or the compiler can at least have a better way to, f to make uh, correct decisions. And in, in these experiments, we also find some, some opportunities. So, uh, so as we can see in this graph, so the first column is use the profile in a profile collected using O2 binary. And if you, if you look uh, very carefully, you, you will find that this, the first column is usually not the best, but the third one or the fifth one or the seventh one are usually a little bit better. It's, it's uh, around like one to two percent better, but d definitely not in the noise range. So why? So the reason why the, the third iteration is better is that each iteration, auto FDO will promote some inline decisions from the IPA inline to the early inline, which means that we will have more context information when we annotate the profile. So so this makes the difference uh, about one or two percent. So this actually makes it possible that auto FDO based profiling can possibly exceed the performance of, of FDO because we have more context. Okay, I think uh, previously what, uh, I was talking about what we plan, what we are currently working on and what we plan to do in the near future. We really hope that we can get the pipeline working so that everybody can just Build it, build the release binary just once, and get the performance. And and when we start with this project, we want to make it as open as possible. So that's why we try to open source this profile generation tool, so the open source community can benefit from from this project. And and we also hope that the open source community can also contribute to this project to make it su successful. 
So, uh, but the, there, there, there are a list of items that we, we hope that open source community can, can help us. So the first one is when we open source this tool, we actually depend on a Google internal, internal implementation of a just run library, which is very fast, but it only supports x86. So if you want to use this tool in non x86 or other architectures, probably you need to like port this to use libbfd. And also, uh, as I showed before, this uh, the way we collect profile still needs two steps. One is to collect the raw profile and uh, use this tool. So if we can integrate this tool as part of perf, it will be very nice because we just use one tool to generate the profile that can be used by GCC. And also we plan to uh, submit this code to Chunk before the 4.9 uh, freeze. So I would appreciate if you can help refill the code. And this uh, so the current implementation of AutoFDO it just opens uh, a door for many optimization opportunities because we use the hardware performance counters to, to collect the profile. And right now the modern architectures, the, there are like uh, more than 100 performance counters available. So, so you can imagine how many things you can do with all these different type of performance counters. And as I mentioned before, the, the LBR profile provides a 16 entries of the, last, uh, of, of the last taken branches, which can actually form a very mini trace of the program. So, and it's actually for free, because you, a hardware did collect these trace, traces. So with this trace, we can have some more like novel uh, GCC optimizations that can bring more performance benefits. And all this information are difficult or even impossible to get in the instrumentation-based approach. So we hope the, the community can, can think of the, the ideas how we can use this and actually improve the performance of other, other FDO. And there are other uh, opportunities to improve because the current propagation uh, algorithm to, to annotate the weighted control flow graph, it's, it's, not, it's just tuned uh, uh, very little, so there are, I believe there are still many tuning opportunities there. And also, the profile of auto FDO is highly dependent on the debugging info, the, uh, the quality of debugging info. I spent uh, much energy last year to improve the debugging info. Now it's better, but still well uh, from perfect. So if, if, uh, if you feel interested to improve the debugging info quality, this will not only benefit auto FDO, but also benefit the whole GNU uh, com community. And finally, if you want to try out FDO, you are more than welcome. And, and if, uh, we, we would really appreciate if you can send any feedback or bug report to us. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, so we have experiments show the minimum number of profiles we want. So it's just like uh, the more you profile, the, bet the, the, the better accurate you, you get. But if you just get the minimum number of samples, then we, could, we, we should be able to get a meaningful speed up for you. Okay, so can you change the frequency during the execution of the profiling? Yeah, we can, we can definitely change that because okay. The higher the frequency, the overhead will also get higher. Yeah. I might have missed it. Um, how do you deal with uh, merging profiles, or do you deal, or do you have, if you uh, want to test against like five or ten or twenty or four hundred runs, do you merge profiles? I might have missed that though. So I apologize. Uh, right now, some teams they they do merge the profiles from different machines. Yeah, okay. but uh, in our test, we ju we don't. We just uh, we just uh, collect the profile from one machine. From one from one machine and one test run of one binary. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The problems you have with the debug info is that fidelity of the line information, uh, discriminator assignment. Or? Yeah, there there are uh, several issues. One is that the. Uh, the the address to line is sometimes not accurate. So, they, so even if one function is inlined, they will miss this inline. Uh, 
function. So they will jump to the other function. So uh, the, the other is that some, some, uh, some instruction was moved during some optimization. And when it's moved, the debugging for was not very carefully t taken care of. So when, when a code, uh, sometimes a code instruction may move to a hot, a, a hot basic block. And uh, if this happens, then we will have the debug info of a code, uh, of a code based basic block marked as hot. So this would cause us as trouble. Yeah, so since, since like a CSE merging something. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I actually had a question about how you deal with uh, the discriminators. I assume you're using those for basic block marking. Yeah. Okay. How do you map those back uh, in the source code when you inline? Uh, so I'm not quite sure about the question. So, uh, so for the inline function, currently we don't have the discriminators for the for the inline call side. Okay. But this would be a problem. I talked to Carrie before. So this would be a problem if there is two call sites at the same line, but this is not very often, right? Uh, debatable whether or not that's often, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Basically, it just relies on, on using the same algorithm to assign discriminators on both components. Okay. It assigns the discriminator one way the first time, and you record the profile data with those discriminators. Then when you compile it again, you're going to assign the same, hopefully, if the code, if the code hasn't changed too much. Right. You're going to assign the same discriminators, and therefore you can take the profile data and assign it. Oh, interesting. As a way of dealing with it, like it said, using column information to get the call site on the line. Yeah. Well, I would expect this array in my name, actually, and you change the code enough that uh, it'll be simple approach. Yeah, that's, that's what I was worried about. If you're using the basic block from the, yeah. I worry about using the basic block Assigned early enough that that happens before. Before early in line? Before early in line. Very early, it's just okay. after CFT. We assign them. Um, it's in yeah, CFT. During amplification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A, a, a question about um, this sampling of the, um, of the jump traces, basically. Mm -hmm. um, are there modes of operation, this is sort of unrelated to what you're doing exactly now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are there modes of operation to use that in branch prediction and then feed that back statistically? Uh, I'm not sure if it's used in branch prediction, but this is a new feature added later than core two, I think. So, so before you can use another thing called BTB, branch tracing buffer. I think BTB is used for branch prediction. Oh, okay. But this LBR, I think it's mainly for like profiling purposes. Yeah, I, th I think it's just the hardware will keep this information there, even in old profiles, uh, in old processes. But now Intel make this pro uh, accessible by the profiling. Yeah. OK. OK, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>